Well, I'm going to get started out of the gate here this morning. Welcome to everybody that uh, is jumping in and joining together with me. Uh, I know usually you're used to the first few minutes of the song, but I'm not giving you that song this morning, partly because for some reason it doesn't seem like it wants to play. So I don't know what's going on in the background, but that is entirely okay. We're we're still here, still getting started. Uh, we are going to go into Proverbs chapter chapter uh, 26 today, and so I just want to uh, encourage you, if you have your Bible and you're going to follow along, you can, you can grab that Bible, and uh, like we... Uh, like I frequently say, I, I always like to have people follow along their own Bible. Yes, I do put it on the screen. Uh, there are, are folks that uh, are busy doing things about their house, uh, you know, making breakfast or getting ready to go to work uh, or that type of thing. Um, maybe driving to work even. And uh, so uh, I know that you, you can't, you can't watch. In fact, if you're driving to work, I'd encourage you not to be looking at the screen here at all because, you know, you could get into a wreck. It's just like praying with your eyes closed uh, while you're driving. That That isn't a, uh, that is not a recommended passage. Don't recommend doing that at all. I uh, encourage you rather to uh, pray with your eyes open. You can do that, you know. I mean, some people did not know that that's a thing. And, uh, it is a thing. In fact, nowhere in the Bible does it actually say to pray with your eyes closed. It doesn't say that is that's just a practice that we've adopted. That I, I I do not recall anywhere in the Bible where it says pray. Thou shalt pray with thine eyes closed. I just I don't remember reading it anywhere. It's just not uh, uh, not there. So I am. Uh, a little bit ahead of, and I am saying good good day to, to Mizaki from Kenya because it's not morning there for them. It is uh, afternoon for them. Should be what? Yeah, little little afternoon. Is it six hours or seven hour? Uh, sometimes it depends on the time of year. Um, whether it's six hours or seven hour difference. Um, so I, I don't know exactly what what the time difference is. I'd have to look it up. Uh, and my phone is busy working as a camera, so I shouldn't ask it. I probably could. It would probably still tell me uh, what the time difference is between here and Nairobi. Um, so... Saying good mornings to folks. I did not play the theme song, the opening song this morning. I, I hit play, but it didn't play for some reason. It looked like it was playing, but there was no sound with it. So uh, I always have to, uh, I'll have to go back and see what's going on with, with the song sound. I checked my microphone now. I've learned at least how to check the microphone and make sure it's going to work. But uh, then I left my coffee over there. I, I kind of, uh, it was a very long day of trying to wrap up a lot of things here next few weeks some planning wrapping up a school year uh going out to a bunch of promotional events um having this uh, prayer gathering tonight at 6 30 out at liberty baptist and then major the major person trying to pull the bunch of churches together uh, ian jewett the pastor at liberty baptist has put together the prayer service and uh, also i mean it's just been fun partnering together with him uh, but just lots of things going on, trying to, trying to get a few other events, a few more events uh, planned out uh, uh, and, and rolling before we go on vacation here in a couple of weeks. So um, I do promise you we are in Proverbs chapter 26 today. I am going to go there. I did not go back and, and retitle things yet. I need to go back and do that. Um, from yesterday, because yesterday we looked at the fourth chapter of uh, fourth chapter of James, 
coming out of the news and the Supreme Court and uh, just some of my musings and thinkings about uh, the reality that too often we are uh, in friendship with the world and an enmity with God. And as much as we try to be friendly with the world, ultimately they're going to reject the message. And sometimes, and this isn't my nature, I am a I am a person that likes to be liked by nature. Um, but sometimes I wonder if, if you know, we, we spend too much time before we throw down the gauntlet and just say, look, here's the gospel. Um, the, 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 these are the facts that, to which we subscribe, the things that we proclaim, the things that we believe, the things that direct our life uh, lives, and so what it means to be a part of us is to subscribe to the same thing. And sometimes I think that we're slow at getting to that message at times because we want to butter everyone up. Now, I, and I get that. Trust me, I, I'm the one that teaches CPR, Cultivate, Plant, Reap. I mean, that's not something that I originated, but it's certainly something I've taught for years. I don't know how many years. 25, 30 years, maybe used the, the CPR acronym called cultivate the relationship, plant the seed of the gospel, and reap the harvest when they're ready to respond. Uh, and yet I, 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 I am wrestling with just where we are uh, as a society, where we are as a country. And, and, and sometimes the posture to, that, that we take as the church to try to be friendly toward the world. And sometimes we water ourselves down in the process Uh Anyway, all that came out of James chapter 4 yesterday, musing on the, the news of uh, the Supreme Court and, and its, its projections of the possibility of uh, throwing a Roe versus Wade out and sending it back to the states. So, you know, for somebody in Africa, uh, who cares? Uh, you, now, I, I don't know what the implications could be of political, uh, judicial decisions made in the United States for uh, of this nature uh, for people in Africa, uh, like Mazaki over there. But but um, they, the other side, there might not be any implications. They go, you American people. I mean, sometimes I think the world does kind of shake its head at us, but yet I also have traveled just enough to know that much of the world is like us uh, and that we're not that much different. So. Uh, again, if you're following along, we are in uh, we are in Book of Proverbs chapter 26, and I am trying to finish up the last few of the of my of the good mornings to folks that are uh, jumping in with us uh, this morning before we get started. So I I am doing that, looking at that screen over on that side. Uh, and then we're going to jump into the text. Somebody uh, said, I, I'm not on social media. In case any of you are wondering, uh, I mean, I do not have to go on to social media to make this work. You you might think that I do, but uh, the, the platform that I use is connected to... Um, uh, is connected to YouTube and connected to Facebook, so I don't have to log on to Facebook or on to YouTube to be able to, uh, you know, make this happen. So there are things, although I was on long enough yesterday, somebody seems to think it's lobster season here. Does that mean we get to go hunting uh, for lobsters? Is that is that the thought? You know, we, we hunt. Uh, I don't think so, but, hey, people from... Uh, Texafornia, uh, E, Texafornia, E. I, I'm trying to get Texas and California and Hawaii all in there in one word. Uh, Texafornia, E. Uh, you're welcome. Anytime. Come to Maine. Uh, bring people from Florida up with you. Bring people from Georgia up with you. We'll, we'll, we'll have a lobster feast. Yes, we will. Glad to. T- I'm talking to Bing out there. I, I did see that comment uh, just passing yesterday um we like lobsters here but you know the the economy and in, in maine the prices of lobsters uh, we were at a place the other day and uh, the lady said you know we would have to charge 40 dollars for a lobster roll sandwich she said so we're we're not we're not doing lobster rolls we're 
we're sticking to crab rolls. It's much, much cheaper, and uh, people are willing to pay the price versus paying $40 for a lobster roll sandwich. Just it is, It's gotten pricey just because of legislation largely and fuel prices and everything else that, that plays a part. Well, you're not in here for all that. You are here for God's Word. You're here for mutual prayer and fellowship and the connectivity. At some point, I will get up from my chair and walk over and get my cup of coffee that is still under my Keurig. Uh, but anyway, here we go. We're going to pick up in verse 13 is where we left off two days ago uh, because I took the hiatus from it yesterday and did the James 4 passage, uh, Proverbs 26, 13. The sluggard says there's a lion in the road, a fierce lion roaming the streets. You know, what, what is he saying as he is saying this? I mean, what, what's the point of saying the lion says there's, there's a lion in the road, a fierce lion roaming the streets? Excuses. He's talking about how we, a lot of times, come up with all kinds of excuses to not do what it is that we need to do. Now, I, I would not uh, classify myself as a sluggard by any stretch of the imagination. However, I would classify myself as a person who sometimes puts things off. Uh, I mean, I put something off that took me mm, a day's work uh, earlier in the week. On Monday, it took, it took a full day's work to do that I put off for a couple of months because I knew it was going to take time to do, and I didn't know exactly how to do it. I had some things to figure. That's why it took a while because I had to figure some things out figured it out, got something done, and it's like, I wish I would have got that done like back in March. But I didn't. Um, I, I had, and so for me, the excuse was I'm so very, very busy, which is true, but I should have pushed something else aside to to, to complete that one task. Uh, sometimes it happens at, at home and uh, where we put things off at home, you know, the, the missus wants us to do something and rather than get to that project, we put it off and put it off and put it off. And there's old saying, you know, uh, just, uh, just because a man uh, doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't get something done doesn't mean you have to keep nagging him every six months about it. Uh, and that's supposed to be a tongue in cheek, ha ha, laugh, laugh. Uh, I wish I had one of those buttons. I, I need to, I need to get one of those little Get something where I can play some of those funny sounds in the background. Uh, that'd be kind of fun. Uh, but the sluggard says there's a line in the road, a fierce line roaming. A, the lazy person always has an excuse for not wanting to work, for not wanting to finish a project, not wanting to um, you know, study for a class. Uh, there's always some reason that a sluggard might give. Now, and here's a question. Can a busy person... Uh, also be a sluggard. I mean, that's that's a question now that I'm asking myself, thinking hmm, maybe, maybe I am a sluggard in certain areas. Uh, I mean, it's easy to be a sluggard when it comes to going for walks right now. Um, it's just easy to not want to go out there and hit, hit the trail and walk. Uh, I, I like to enjoy going for walks, but the schedule is such that, you know, I, I really need to be back in the office at 9 o'clock most days uh, after I finish here. Uh, and then our other days, like yesterday, I had a, a breakfast appointment at 7.30. So, um, but we make excuses for for the things maybe that we don't want to do. The, the sluggard makes excuses saying, saying there's a lion in the road, a fierce lion roaming the streets. I, I wonder what uh, Peterson does in the message with this. Uh, let's take a look real fast. I, sorry, I'll have to drag this down the page. Uh, I guess you're not looking at it yet, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, he uses the word loafers. He says, loafers say it's dangerous out there. Tigers are prowling the streets, and then they pull the cover back over their heads. I mean, that that is that is how Peterson puts it in the message. Take us back to the NIV 84, where we were before. The sluggard says there's a line in the road. So, Verse 14 continues this motif of the sluggard, and it says, As a door turns on its hinges, so a sluggard turns on his bed. That might be why I didn't get my song up and going this morning, because I was uh, I was turning on my bed. Um, 
the alarm went off at five o'clock. I, I mean, I, I have typically been a person who is, uh, you know, up in the morning. I'm a morning person. I, I, I don't, I don't mind one bit being up and being busy getting going in the morning, but I, I'm, I'm running out of steam here a little bit. And so, um, in the morning, the alarm hits, and, and my alarm wakes up with nice music, and it says, good morning. The time is 5 o'clock. The weather is, and it reads to me, and it would even read me the headlines if I'd let it keep playing, um, but I turn it off as soon as I hear what the weather forecast is. It just I turn it off. This morning, I, I set it to, um, uh, it's not pause, repeat, that's not the word. Anyway, I told it to, it could ring again in like 25 more minutes, which is exactly what I did after 25 minutes. It, it snooze, dis, dismiss or snooze. Uh, I, I let the snooze snooze this morning. Uh, so as a door turns, uh, turns on its hinges, so a sluggard turns on his bed. In that way, maybe being a little bit lazy this morning. Yeah, that was the word, Fran, snooze. I, I couldn't find that word. There's dismiss and there are snooze. And, and I uh, I hit the snooze. A lot of times I haven't had to do that. But of late, I've been hitting the snooze more frequently. I did it this morning. My computer wasn't set up in my office because I had it with me yesterday. And uh, um, so I had a few things to set up this morning. Verse 15 continues and says, The sluggard buries his hand in his dish. He is too lazy to bring it back to his mouth. It's like, you know, he, he just... The slugger just kind of falls asleep right there at the dish and, and just the hand goes down. and I mean, too, too lazy to even bring the dish back up, or bring the, 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 the dish or to bring the, uh, the spoon, the utensil, whatever it might be, back up to their mouth. And, uh, I mean, that's lazy. I, mean, I like to eat. And, you know, being tired is not going to keep me from uh, a brownie or from a burger or from whatever it is that I might eat if, 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 if I'm in that spot, you know. But the true sluggard, the loafer, uh, it buries his hand in this dish, too lazy to bring it back. Somebody else feed me. I don't even want to feed myself. I mean, that's, that's kind of what is being said here. Uh, and to make sure that we are not those lazy people. Um, verse 26, I'm sorry, verse 16 continues on. It says, the slugger is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who answer discreetly. I mean, the slugger, and sluggards are very good at manipulation. Sluggards are very good at always having a, the better answer, always knowing more, always... I mean, because they learn how to tell themselves lies to excuse themselves from the work that, that they need to do, from the things that they need to give themselves to. I, I just wonder what uh, what it says in the message paraphrase in verse 16. Let's take a look at that. It says, dreamers fantasize about their self-importance. They think they're smarter than the whole college faculty. You know, I, I know that I'm a low man on the totem pole around some of the academics uh, that, that, that I have the privilege of being around on a frequent basis, uh, realize yeah, maybe I'm not that important. But dreamers fantasize or these sluggards fantasize about their self-importance, their self-worth, all they have to bring to the table. They think that they're smarter. You know, to, to learn to not be a sluggard, to learn to, to not... Uh, fill your mind with with thoughts, with grandiose thoughts of self. Um, just to not go there, to to not do that, uh, to to be a person that begins to pick up the pace. Now it's like exercise. We hate exercise. A lot of us. Uh, how many of you would raise your hands and say, you know, I, and maybe hate is too strong a word. Loathe might be the word. Uh, or dislike might be the word. It's just not your favorite thing. I mean, there, there could be any number of ways that you could put that. But, you know, once we get out there and get going, we, we feel better. And, and that could be an area where we need to tell ourselves, I'm going to make myself feel, I'm going to go for that walk over on the footbridge. Just going to do it. You know, now we, we do come to a certain point in life when that is not something that, that maybe we have the ability to do any longer. Uh, but many of us do. 
Uh, and it might not be a footbridge. It might be a covered bridge if you're in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, uh, something like that, but to get out and get some exercise. And, and, and so we'd rather not go to do that. Uh, some of us even have very expensive coat hangers in our homes, do we not? You know what I'm talking about? Very expensive coat hanger. That very expensive coat hanger being uh, being that uh, that expensive coat hanger being that treadmill that sits there and you've thrown coats on and you've thrown hoodies on and you've thrown blazers on and, you know, towels on or, you know, just whatever. And, and so there are, I have, we have been those people that have had these expensive uh, coat hangers in our house along the way. And perhaps that has been you too, uh, or an elliptical or a tread climber or a, uh, any number of things that it is that you might have uh, that expensive coat hanger, that that piece of exercise equipment that you just had to have. You know, you watched Christy Brinkley and um, who's the karate guy? Did Walker, Texas Ranger? I can't. Chuck Norris. You know, um, you watched and so oh, you had you just had to buy that piece and you got it and used it four times and there it sits. Well, we do that. Uh, it, Find something. You go for a walk. I mean, walking has is, is been proven to be a, a very healthy uh, practice for us. Don't be a loafer. Don't be a sluggard. Don't be a dreamer. Be honest with self. Uh, take, the, uh, take the actions that you need to take when it comes to exercise and things of that nature or with work or with that project that you're putting off, whatever that might be. Verse 17, it begins to change up just a little bit. And it says, Like one who seizes a dog by the ears is a passerby who meddles in a quarrel, not his own. I mean, what is this telling us? Like one who seizes a dog by the ears is a passerby who meddles in a quarrel, not his own. What's, you, could, you could summarize this in three words. Those three words are mind. No, four words. Mind your own business. Mind your own business. That's, that's, that's largely what it is saying in verse 17. Like one who seizes a dog. The dog doesn't like it too much. Uh, you might get your hand bit uh, by that dog if you go grabbing that dog by the ear and might just happen. Well, you might get your head bit off by by a few people in a coral when you go sticking your nose in when you shouldn't be sticking your nose in. I mean, that's, and some of us are, we're, we're the fixers, you know, we're going to fix the problem. And sometimes we got to realize we can't fix the problem. Uh, sometimes time might fix the problem. Sometimes unfortunate circumstances could fix the problem. The death and illness, something of that nature happens and that, that, that could fix the problem when people realize how foolish they've been. Uh, but some of us, we're, we're going to just bulldoze our way in there and make make it right with these people. You cannot do that, uh, at least not wisely. Uh, if you don't want to get your, your head bit off, you just you keep your distance from it. Sometimes, some of us, we are called in to try to solve some of these problems and some of these issues in a person's life. Uh, or in a relational conflict, but ultimately it comes down to the people being willing to lay aside grievances, being willing to offer forgiveness, being willing to acknowledge their own fault and their own wrongs in the circumstance. I mean, that that ultimately is something that, that has to happen. Uh, and yes, you, you might be one who's called as a counselor or a therapist or something to try to mitigate or even as a a mediator or a lawyer or a judge, hope it doesn't get that far, uh, to, to mediate some of these things. But ultimately, um, it comes down to the people working out their own, their own issues as uh, a, a former Rush Limbaugh used to say, issues at times poking some fun at somebody, and I don't know who that was. Like one who seizes a dog by the ears is a passerby who meddles in a quarrel, not his own. Keep out of it. Verse 18, like a madman shooting firebrands or deadly arrows is a man who deceives his neighbor and says, 
I was only joking. I mean, how many of us have ever been around? You're going to you're going to hear my chair, folks, because I'm getting up to go to my coffee. Um, and I'm going to change up my microphone because I, I need to have a swig of coffee here this morning. Uh, but I was only joking. How, how many of you know people that are like that, that joke around, but they don't know when to quit? So, and sometimes we'll say things rather harshly, uh, rather pain, uh, painfully, um, and say I was only joking. I mean, you, you cut someone right down to the quick and, and yet have the audacity to say to them, uh, it was just a joke. Come on, lighten up, dude. Well, maybe you just castigated them and wounded them deeply, said something that, that took them right back to their childhood and and now they want to lie, lay down, lie down in a fetal position because you don't know how your words may have wounded them. So like a madman shooting firebrands or deadly arrows is a man who deceives his neighbor and says, I was only joking. So there, there's the, the saying the harsh things, but then there's also the aspect of deceiving and saying, I was just kidding around. And, and I've done that along the way. I like to joke around and, uh, but there are a few times I look back on, I, I think of one very vividly. I was helping lead a youth event, and I was joking about my name, not my name, about my age or something like that. And another youth leader came and said, you know, that, that kid really looks up to you. And, you know, the fact that you just told a lie is something he's aware of. And, uh, you know, it's really bothering him. Like, I was only kidding about, I mean, I was 27 and kidding about being 57. And obvious, I wasn't 57, and uh, but yet that that little bit of fun that I was only joking. I mean, it it set someone back in their life, and we have to realize the power of of what we do like that. Sometimes, have you? Now, I'll ask this question: Have you ever had that experience in your own life where somebody has said something jokingly to you, uh, or? does a little bit of mild deceit and, and it really caused some internal uh, damage, whether it was momentary or it lasted for a few hours, a few days, a few weeks. Ever been in that situation? Go ahead and answer that question. I'm going to step across the other side of the desk and grab that cup of coffee so we can have coffee together. And the question was, Poking around like that. Got my stevia in my coffee. And I am back. So no takers on the question at this point in time. Uh, Jessica saying many times. Yeah, and, and sometimes, I mean, sometimes we ask ourselves, is our skin too thin? You know, that, and sometimes we are kind of thin-skinned and, and our skin, uh, you know, our, the, the thinness of our skin, we shouldn't be wounded, but we get wounded. But sometimes also people just pick and pick and pick and pick and pick and do not know when to stop. Um, that joking. Uh, and Priscilla is saying, yes, and I still feel wounded by it. Um, we, we get wounded. We get hurt. We get, it's just, it's hard on us. Um, now, are you, are you referring to something that happened a long time ago that you still feel wounded by? Uh, like, like a particular occasion? Is, is that what you're uh, referencing? You don't have to give us details. I'm just asking if this is something that was a particular occasion where something was said or done or joke or deceit or something like that, uh, and and it still still stings and still feel wounded. Uh, or or are you saying I still feel wounded by by the the joking around sometimes? I I need to know that because I like to joke around and I don't want to be one to wound you uh, in in jocularity. So. I wouldn't want to do that ever. 
Well, let's continue in the passage. You you can you can continue to leave comments over in the comment section. Uh, verse twenty says, "Without wood, a fire goes out. Without gossip, a quarrel dies down." Some, I mean, I can say this. Sometimes, if you just leave it alone, a quarrel will go out all on its own. Sometimes we think, no, we that that's that's not the thing we need to do. We need to be proactive at solving the issue. But, well, sometimes the best thing you can do is leave it alone. You know, it's like a wound. It's like it's like that scab uh, that, that, that over a wound. And sometimes we kind of pick at that scab, and, and next thing we know, that's bleeding all over the place. And uh, you know, sometimes we just we just need to leave it alone. Without wood, a fire goes out. Without gossip, a quarrel dies down. So, I mean, there's there's the gossip aspect to make sure that gossip isn't adding to to the problem. We we, we don't want to want that to happen. But uh, but also just just sometimes giving things time. Now, I I, I don't know that it is entirely true that, that time heals wounds, but but I do believe that time does help sometimes toward the healing of wounds. Sometimes we need to talk things through. Sometimes we just need to let things die. It's in the past, it's gone, and, and never to be brought up again, and you move on. And I, Some people are like, well, that's just brushing it under the carpet. Well, you know, may, maybe you were over, you, you've been, o- you're overthinking this. Maybe you're overtrained, you know, uh, in, in social sciences and in college or something like that, and uh, I, I I would just simply tell you, and the scripture seems to to bear this out. Sometimes you you leave it alone, and it will it will go away on its own. Yes, sometimes we do need to roll the carpet back and deal with the dirt that's underneath there because there's a bump there, and we got to deal with it. Sometimes that is true. More often true than not, but I also think that sometimes you just let it go. Let it go is, is sometimes what we do, and. Because love, and we've read this in the Proverbs, love covers over a multitude of sins. So we allow love to cover over that multitude of sins and uh, uh, allow it to go away. And so now, there are some comments. I want to look at some of those comments. Uh, Priscilla said this a long time ago by my father. I also feel people use, I was just joking insincerely. And that. That you're bringing up a good point because I I think that sometimes that is absolutely true that people weren't really joking but what do they say I was only joking when the fact is that eh, maybe they weren't only joking uh, maybe they were thoughtless maybe they were reckless uh, but they weren't also only joking I mean that, I think that is also a, a true factor and and I I appreciate that added insight here I was just joking and, and, and they don't mean it they really weren't just joking Don said I have a few things that I have had to say uh, uh, let go and let God they're just things you need to leave behind and you know as some would say is, is that a true statement well I I you know, we can overanalyze things. I think sometimes we do. Sometimes there's nothing we can do in a circumstance. And and I think sometimes what, what we have to do is just give it to God. Uh, sometimes the excuse come, becomes, well, I'm just letting God take care of that. When we have things we need to do ourselves. As an example, you, you, you were in a rift with somebody. You know you did something that just really royally, uh, you know, pork them and uh, you probably need to go back and say no I, I did that I was wrong I'm sorry now if they if they can't say I forgive you if they can't give um, if they can't give a forgiveness uh, accept an apology well now that is really on that person sometimes we just need to go and try to fix something but with somebody uh, that that is also true, and and learning when to let go, and, and learning when it's bigger than what you can deal with, and you have to let God deal with it because maybe you've tried dealing with it, and there is just no conclusion to the matter. Um, so we sometimes do have to let God take care of it. Purcell also said that the receiver of the joke is accused of having no sense of humor. Has that ever happened to you? Where where come on now, lighten up, have some fun. 
you know, you don't have any sense of humor. Well, if, if you considered perhaps the weight of, uh, uh, of the infraction uh, given in the words spoken, maybe you'd realize that it maybe wasn't a joking matter. And, and the person, the jokester is the person in the air. And, and, and I would agree with what you have to say there. Absolutely. Priscilla. Well, let's cut back over to the text. It says, as charcoal to embers and as wood to fire, so is a quarrelsome man for kindling strife. Notice it says the man this time. At least the man gets blamed for the problem, and it isn't, uh, it isn't just, uh, you know, it's not saying the woman or the wife. Um, yeah. I'm going to come back over on the other side here in a moment. Uh, charcoal to embers. And as wood to fire, so is a quarrelsome man for killing strife. Uh, somebody saying, I'm trying trying to let go, but sometimes it's hard, and, which is true. Uh, sometimes it is hard to, uh, hard to let go of things. Now, there are people, and... and and I guess this is what I want to say. We sometimes need to learn that there are people who um, sometimes we, we need to move on. Sometimes uh, we, we have to move out of a situation with, uh, out of a relationship sometimes. Sometimes it's so toxic. Sometimes it's so unhealthy. Uh, sometimes the, the, the offender continues just the offenses and they're not going to change. And sometimes... I have a book on my shelf. I think it's on my shelf. I may have lent it out to somebody, but the title is simply Necessary Endings. And, and it gives some biblical substantiation for times when we do need to uh, remove ourselves, extricate ourselves from relationship. Sometimes it has to do uh, in the workplace. Sometimes it's like, you know, I, I need to move on from this job because it's just destroying my soul. Uh, now, I'm not giving that as an excuse to you, but sometimes you're just in that place where your soul is being destroyed and, and you need to move on from that work. Sometimes it's in a, a relationship with somebody that's a purported friend. Sometimes, sadly, even, this is true in a marriage. Now, you say, Pastor, you're a pastor. You're supposed to advocate for marriage to the, to the ninth end. Listen, I'm just going to be honest with you, and, and, and I, I think that I'm not being unwise here. Yes, you should do everything you can to try to preserve the marriage. However, sometimes you're just not going to be able to do it. Sometimes the person doesn't change, and sometimes it's for your own safety that you get out of uh, out of an abusive situation. I mean, as much as God hates divorce, and as much as we've made divorce to be, uh, such a, a bad thing, you know, it's almost like sometimes it's the unpardonable sin. Well, it is not the unpardonable sin. Uh, and sometimes that is the course of action that we need to take. So sometimes that, so what I'm saying is there's any number of levels of relationships where this applies. It can apply with friends. It can apply with uh, even siblings. It, it can apply with the, the workplace. It, it can apply with people in the life of the church, unfortunately. Uh, it, it can it can even apply within a marriage sometimes. And, and just what do you do uh, in this? Uh, sometimes what we want to do is we want to keep the fight going with a spouse, and we need to learn just to be able to let let it go and uh, and move on. Sometimes that's just where we need to go with it. Well, back over on the other side, it says this: the words of a gossip. I get it on the screen for you. The words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They go down to a man's inmost parts. Sometimes we really like the gossip. Sometimes we we just we 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 like the juicy tidbits. It's like you know why is National Enquirer still a thing or magazines that are like that because people like gossip. It's like going to a race. People like wrecks. As long as nobody gets killed. You know, and the, the driver walks away. People love to see a car flip over, somersault three or four or five times, and yet watch the driver walk away. I mean, people love that type of stuff. Um, so a, a, a wreck at a race is kind of like uh, uh, gossip 
uh, to a, a man's innermost part. Sometimes we, we like these types of things way, way, way more than we should. Um, this is confronted gossip. If you were a gossip sayer, if you were a gossip receiver, maybe there's some changes in our beings that we need to make to not be people who uh, are inclined toward gossip, that we learn uh, to not say it, to zip the lips, or we're inclined to say, ah, you know what, That's, that sounds like somebody else's business. I, I really don't need to hear about that. Now, that isn't the human tendency. It's not the tendency of the flesh, but I believe that's a godly tendency to go, I, I don't need to hear it. And, you know, I, I will tell you that sometimes I have the inclination that, you know, I, I want to know that tidbit. Uh, and, and I've been around even some younger people who go, you know, it's not, I just don't need to know that. It's not my business. And for us to learn to be able to tell people, look, it's not my business. Doesn't sound like it's your business either. Maybe to push back on them a little bit and say, you know, it kind of looks like gossip. And smells like gossip, probably gossip, probably shouldn't be doing it. So uh, to learn how to deal with those types of situations. Verse 23 says, like a coating of glaze over earthenware are fervent lips with an evil heart. Now, this is a, a very interesting verse. Like a coating of glaze over earthenware are fervent lips with an evil heart. Hardened, perhaps, is what it's saying. That is verse 23. Let's see if we get some insights out of the message paraphrase. Smooth talk from an evil heart is like glaze on cracked pottery. Okay. Um, smooth talk from an evil heart, glaze on cracked pottery. The, 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 uh, the, pot, the, the pottery might look... Um, the pottery might look good, but it's covered over with glaze. You maybe can't see the cracks, but it's still cracked. The moment you pour something into it, it's just going to come running right out. So to learn to uh, to not do that with, uh, with what we say, smooth talk, to not be a smooth talker, we, I mean, to ask God to search our hearts, to ask God to evaluate our souls, to, to ask God to evaluate our words, so that we do not give smooth talk from the evil heart. I mean, just to not be a smooth talker. Now, sometimes it's okay to be. I mean, what's the difference between being a gracious talker and a smooth talker? I I, I think there's a difference. I, in fact, I know there's a difference. Um, I I want to be a gracious talker, person who who responds graciously in circumstances. Smooth talk often a word that might be connoted, uh, connotated with smooth might be manipulative. Manipulative talk from the evil heart. Do not be a manipulator. Verse 24 says, your enemy shakes hands and greets you like an old friend, all the while conniving against you. Um, I mean, we have been in situations like that, have we not, where, you know, okay, this seems warm and wonderful, but you're, you kind of keep one eye open and one ear to the ground, just kind of watching out because this person has been an enemy in the past. And sometimes we want to think the best of people that, you know, they're, they're just, they're just being a good person and they're just, uh, uh, they're changing. I mean, this is the whole Putin type of, uh, situation that we'd be talking about. Everybody want to give the benefit of the doubt and he's changing and, and he, you know, he's, he's going to be a good player on the world stage and, and, be a nice, nice boy and all that, and look at where we are. I don't think that I, I, I think that the presidents uh, before us uh, were trying to be wise uh, and 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 trying to give the man the benefit of the doubt, maybe some sometimes too much. Um, but look what happens: an enemy shakes hands, greets you like an old friend, all the while conniving against you. And how much of that happens? And you watch. You watch these television shows and whatnot, movies, and you see this happening, and and you think, hmm, will that happen? I, I'm going to finish a few verses and come back over to the comments here. Um, it says, when he speaks warmly to you, don't believe him for a minute. He's just waiting for a chance to rip you off. Uh, again, this is, this is in the message paraphrase. As no matter how cunningly he conceals his malice, eventually his evil will be exposed in public. The malice backfires, the spite boomerangs. Liars hate their victims. Flatterers sabotage trust. 
Uh, let's look at these last few verses in the NIV 84. Uh, verse 24, a malicious man disguises himself with his lips, but in his heart he harbors deceit. Though his speech is charming, do not believe him, for seven abominations fill his heart. His malice may be concealed by deception, but his wickedness will be exposed in the assembly. If a man digs a pit, he will fall into it. If a man rolls a stone, it will roll back on him. So don't don't dig the pit. Uh, don't roll back uh, the stone because it's going to come back and bite you. A lying tongue hates those that hurts, and a flattering mouth works ruin. I mean, the power of the tongue. The first half of this chapter dealt with fools, and it seems like the second half, or, well, maybe a, a, a section... Uh, 15% dealt with the sluggard, and uh, then, again, another major chunk here at the end um, uh, dealing with the gossip and with the tongue and how powerful the tongue can be. Well, I'm going to swing over to the comment section here because there are comments and questions that I need to look at. Mazaki, if there could... Uh, be an intern exchange program where we invite some of you in Kenya to uh, also share amongst the locals in Africa. This would really be good. I would love to go over there. In fact, we have a lady from our church that has a orphanage over there and uh, that she's needing to find leadership for. And uh, that'd be a lot of fun. It'd be a lot of fun to bring some from Kenya over here and for us to learn about your experiences and be a little bit more global in that way. I, I think that's something we need to investigate. In fact, there's another, it's not Kenya, another country um, that, that's saying, hey, can't you come do teaching over here? And for me, part of it is how much, uh, I mean, I I would almost have to leave this this ministry of this church to do all the other things that, that I am being asked to go and do. Uh, but it is the ministry of this church that gives me the resources to do the things that uh, I would need to go and do. So trying to, to figure that out. But I think we need to talk a little bit more. Uh, we can do that in Messenger, see what that would look like. Um, Jessica, I know this is off subject, but I'm getting ready to go into work. I'm asking for prayers for an attitude adjustment. Uh, an injured... I injured a muscle in my arm, and I'm attending occupational therapy. I'm on a no weight bearing limit. It's affecting my attitude at work because I feel I can't do my job properly. I get aggravated easily because of not being able to use my arm. The pain and aching in it, and it's not. And not only is it affecting me physically, but also mentally. So, Lord, we do stop right now. As Jessica prepares to go into work, we pray for her that you would help her to be able to overcome today that you would that you would change her attitude as uh, one of our professors Joan Tompkins used to say attitude that Lord you would help her with her attitude and uh, heighten her altitude that she might overcome the attitude so we left her to you uh, and, and pray that you would uh, mitigate the pain and the suffering uh, and help her to be able to uh, do what she can do at work and find joy in that and not be frustrated about what she can't do. Lord, lead in her life, we pray. Lord, as we pray for Jessica, uh, we also want to pray this morning for the world, the world stage, the world situation, what's happening uh, over in, uh, in Europe, what's happening in the Middle East, uh, what's happening in our own country. Uh, Lord, especially for those that are overwhelmed through the war in in Ukraine even if they've escaped lord to be overwhelmed by the reality of their lost homes and lost loved ones and all of that lord bring comfort strengthen those and give the resources to those who are ministering to those in need over there in that part of the world lord we pray all this in Jesus' name, and as we're learning to say as God's people and all God's people said, Lord, hear our prayer. Have a good day, everyone.